<laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> With, with that introduction. But hello, everybody, and it's really exciting to see all of the people in the room and all the energy here um, and to return to the stage. You know, I've been uh, part of the Media Lab ecosystem. I was part of the Media Lab ecosystem on and off for a good 20 years, uh, this building and the building over. And the energy that you feel in this room is very much the energy with all the other sort of technologi technological breakthroughs we've seen. Uh, over the past couple of years. And I think one thing that's really interesting is that if you go back to the first event I went to in one of these two buildings was in the 90s. And at that point, a lot of people in the audience would identify the vertical that they worked in as the internet, right? Do you remember? How many people remember? Raise your hand if you remember when internet was a, was a vertical from a drop-down menu. That's awesome. And I think AI is really in that place right now where the breakthroughs that we've seen in AI uh, are pushing it forward from being a category to something that is table stakes and literally everything we're doing. Everyone on this fantastic panel is working on using artificial intelligence or helping companies use these breakthrough AI techniques to do something really awesome. Uh, and so I'm going to turn it over to the panel right now to give a qu quick introduction of themselves and what they're working on. AJ, do you want to start? Sure. Hey everyone, uh, I'm AJ Keller. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Neurosity. We make wearables for mental health. Uh, I am a computer engineer from Clemson University originally, so my first time up here at MIT. Uh, but I live in San Francisco now, uh, really trying to leverage a lot of the uh, adversity that I've gone through with uh, my own mental health issues into creating solutions uh, for the next generation of kids and the current generation of, you know, people who are, have contraindications with pharmaceuticals, can we leverage AI and wearables uh, to really take a chunk out of Big Pharma's pocket or just work complimentary to them. Uh, but that's what I'm doing here, spreading the word, and uh, just excited to be here. Thank you. Uh, Alan Chabra, I grew up down the street here in Boston. I'm a Course 2 and Course 16 alumni of MIT, and it's uh, an honor to be back. I work for a company called MongoDB. I'm on our executive team. I've been there for nine years. If you don't know what MongoDB is, uh, we believe we're the most popular data platform in the world. We have 50,000 paying customers, over 300 million downloads of our product, and hundreds of thousands of applications are built on MongoDB. And our customers are demanding that we help them take those applications and make them Gen AI ready. Our platform combines operational meta and a vector database together. And um, what I do for Mongo is I bring partners together, like the companies on this panel. And I'd love to share how that's helping drive innovation. Thank you. I'm Brendan. I grew up in Menlo Park, went to school for a couple of years, and dropped out, and founded Mercore, which uses AI to automate talent assessment. Similar to how a human would manually review a resume or join a Zoom room and conduct an interview, we use AI to perfectly emulate those processes with a talent pool of over 300,000 people, where we work with a lot of the top AI companies in Silicon Valley to help them when they want to hire thousands of people in a given year uh, to query over and understand the exact background of an individual that they should add to their team. Uh, I'm Raj Agarwal, uh, work at a company, AWS, a uh, cloud computing platform. Um, and I, my role there is uh, to build the generative AI capabilities for all of our go-to-market teams. Um, and through that, uh, end up being the first design partner and customer for all of the internal generative AI capabilities that we're putting, building and putting out to the market. Um, prior to this, uh, I had built and sold two companies here in Boston. Um, that's probably enough about me. So the title of this panel is Next Breakthroughs in AI. And I think one of the a really good question is, we've seen so many interesting technologies, hardware, software, applications over the course of this day. Which breakthrough do you think your particular applications and your, your customers that you work with would most benefit from that could happen in the next year? And which breakthrough do you think you're going to get? Like in, in, in a dream world, what breakthrough would you get? And what breakthrough do you think is actually going to happen? Uh, actually, let's start at the other side. So I'll start with Laraj. Sure. Maybe like on the kind of the granular or the maybe nearer term side of things, uh, a lot of people are 
experimenting with RAG, and then they're trying to bring that together with uh, just the LLM, right? And right now, the results uh, that a lot of people are getting are a little bit, uh, for enterprise use cases, are a little sub, 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 you know, substandard. They're not quite cutting it. They're not giving the right quality of answers, uh, still hallucinations part of it. So I think a, a near-term breakthrough would be to figure out how to really bring that data that you're retrieving connected to the model so that you've got the best of your internal company data and the best of what you know chat gpt and other llms can do in one single package yeah su super interesting i am really interested in sort of the breakthroughs that could happen in model self-improvement where right now there's a workflow that researchers at frontier labs go through where they identify a weakness in a given model and then they curate a data set uh, that they can train that model on to help improve its abilities in a given area. Uh, and this process is run by researchers, done relatively manually, but soon the models are going to be able to identify their own weaknesses, to curate the kinds of questions, the kinds of prompts that they need answers to, to learn from and solve those weaknesses, and, and then distribute those tasks to the humans anywhere in the world that can solve them. And I think once we get there, it'll be one of the most profoundly impactful things on model self-improvement and, and just sort of the foundational technology uh, that all of this is built on. My hope is that that's for the better. Uh, my fear is you know, some risks associated with where that leads us. That's great. Um, I would say two breakthroughs. First, um, we've already seen that developers are taking over the world. Um, developers around the world are writing software, helping companies innovate, stay ahead of the competition, startups, enterprises. I think the advancements in code generation and co-pilot tooling with AI allows anyone, uh, wherever they are in the world, whatever age, to learn how to code better and faster. So the more people who can code using co-pilot and code generation is going to just cause so much more innovation and great uh, production of applications to help customers. I think that's probably what I'm most excited about. The more developers who can do it better, faster, it's going to be better for the world. I think second, um, six months ago, especially in the enterprise customer segment, which MongoDB I spent a lot of time with, there was um, fear of AI, trust, uh, is my data secure, is my uh, compliance, governance. And I think vendors like, uh, like AWS and Mongo, um, we've learned how to help them with these types of problems so that they become less nervous and trust AI more, and that's going to let them take that leap of faith to go innovate their applications in their estate. Uh, the breakthrough that I want to happen is a large foundational model for time series data that essentially takes brain data in from multiple sources, whether that's you know electrical activity, imaging data, uh, focused ultrasound, uh, and essentially is able to create uh, a more cohesive, you know, embedding uh, and essentially be able to uh, create a whole new layer of applications for monitoring brain activity that are based on this embeddings layer. Uh, if we can remove the complexity of having to acquire copious amounts of data uh, that is required for making any sense of brain activity and augment that with a foundational model, we really stand at the prep, you know, at, at this uh, amazing breakthrough of really meaningful software applications being built surrounding uh, AI and, or, you know, surrounding the brain. Uh, what I think will happen is uh, we're going to release the first foundational model. We're going to do it open source, uh, you know, and I really want to see pickup uh, of the, uh, you know, academics and industry really help make a better collaborative model so that we can all have a better application suite for our users. And I think underlying all of this is, is sort of a bunch of architectural questions that we're still really hashing out with regards to how are we going to operationalize using generative AI and, and large AI systems. And there's almost two schools of thought, right? There's been a lot of um, momentum towards building data lakes and the like, towards a digital transformation, towards putting all of data in one place and then building an insights layer on top of it. But if we look at RAG and we look at some of the distributed open source projects that have come out, we see also a multi-cloud, multi-silo um, almost approach 
where we're using, where, where the data is more distributed and the insights are more centralized. Alan and Raj, can you talk a little bit about what you see in the customers uh, with regards to sort of these two different ways of approaching data architecture and where you think it's going? I mean, getting your, your data is the most valuable thing that you have and putting it into action is sort of the whole game, right? But the problem in most companies is that data is very difficult to put together. It's messy. It's, it's, it's different structures, different taxonomies. And so, you know, even pre-generative AI world, right? Like that, that's the big challenge is how do you clean, clean this data? How do you make it usable? How do you pipe it together? And so that continues to be one of the reasons why you don't see as many things in production. Right, so prototype, you got a little sample data set, you create something, CEO's excited, right? But then to go from there to in production, there's this huge amount of messiness in the data. Now, if you're a multi-cloud or your combination of on-prem and, on -cl uh, and cloud, it's even messier. So look, if you are in one cloud, maybe arguably there's some advantages there. You have same access permissions and you don't have to do as much data piping, but ultimately you still need to get that data into the prompt. Let's just say for simple use cases, right? You still need to get it into the prompt and it still needs to be structured. So, you know, what I look forward to, maybe this is the last question, is breakthroughs. Um, can generative AI help you automatically clean that data mm -hmm. and structure it and yeah. make it more usable? Uh, so I think we'll get there, but today companies are struggling with that, and uh, you know it's probably a big opportunity for the Accentures of the world to come in and uh, and earn some more fees and uh, helping make that usable. I would uh, echo what Rod said, and I think there are a lot of companies, uh, startups in the room, people uh, building out go to market uh, as a startup in the AI world. Um, it's important to know if you are targeting enterprise customers, they have a challenge with data. Um, especially in AI, makes it even more difficult. Uh, a line of business for an enterprise is going to want to figure out how to use AI tomorrow. How do I make my apps better, smarter? How do I deploy RAG architectures to make me leaner and faster? A line of business enterprise wants that. On the flip side, ops and SecOps, they're under a lot of pressure. The data, they want to keep the data on premise. They want to put it in the cloud. Do they want it multi-cloud? How are they going to deal with the compliance and governance and data sovereignty it. So if you are a startup or a, even a more mature company vendor selling to the enterprise AI, you need to understand that that struggle isn't actually made easier on AI by AI. It actually makes it more complex. So you need to be able to communicate with that, that you first you understand that pain. And I'd recommend you go in with messaging of how you can bring those two groups together. And if you can bring them together, 100% innovation will happen. So. You mentioned that a lot of people in the room are, are startups or are thinking of starting companies or somewhere in that journey. Um, breakthroughs for startups can kind of be a double-edged sword. Uh, with the rapid pace of innovation, it can be really difficult to figure out what to work on and what's a safe area to be building technology, be building a moat. Um, Brendan and AJ, can you talk a little bit about how that decision has worked for you guys and, and what you think about moving forward and what advice yeah, you would give? Yeah, absolutely. So I think obviously the models are going to get really good really fast. And the key thing to focus on is what kind of data sets or code bases you should curate to prepare for that. I think right now, uh, people aren't really thinking about their post-training data set in particular in the right way, where people are going to start to realize that similar to how you would iterate a code base across 10 years, and that's where the core enterprise value of a SaaS application might lie, they're going to start curating their data sets uh, for po post-training, uh, investing huge amounts of money into getting you know, well-structured data that has the right tokens in it to give the model whatever abilities they need. Uh, and we're already seeing billions and billions of dollars flowing into this uh, from both the frontier labs as well as application layer companies. <laughs> All right, come on, come on. <laughs>